everyone and welcome to the EdTech Podcast. My name is Sophie Bailey and this is the podcast which aims to improve the dialogue between ed and tech for better innovation through storytelling. What does that mean? Well, basically, we bring everyone together on the podcast from teachers and lecturers, startups and blue chips, government and investors to talk about what's changing in education, teaching and learning from the cradle to the grave. Hopefully, as a result of hearing these stories, you can reach out, connect and make interesting things happen. And if we can find out some good book recommendations and funny stories along the way, even better. The last couple of weeks have been super busy for me and I'm sure many of our UK listeners are feeling the same as you get back into the new term. As always, best of luck and we wish you hundreds of cups of coffee, bountiful rest and epic lesson planning without any left field policy changes. Last week, I ran a meetup on Monday, met up with Jamie Brooker, the founder of Kahoot on Tuesday, and hosted a whole group of Spanish academics focused on entrepreneurship from Startup Spain on Friday. In between, I worked feverishly on a secret squirrel project, plus a forthcoming podcast series and extra future episodes on everything from playful learning, YouTube tutorials and how much universities are adapting to online learning. This week, I'm delighted to welcome our new intern, Liz Reed from Philadelphia, who will be lightening the load and helping me prepare for all the upcoming events. You can find out more about Liz on our blog, theedtechpodcast.com forward slash blog. I'm speaking at Innovate EdTech on the 11th of November with the Harris Federation, the British Dyslexia Association, Detective Dot and School 21. We're talking about various perspectives of learner-centred design. For EdTech podcast listeners, there's a sneaky discount code for tickets with the code EDTECH50, so make the most of that. Further down the line, I'm at Women Ed West Mids on the 18th of November talking about women in EdTech. For those ladies listening and men folk interested in the bias of design at source, follow at EdTech Women UK for more info. And finally, on the 30th, I'm moderating a panel on adaptive learning technology at Nesta's Future Skills event. Outside of that, there's the UFI Vocational Tech event, Ed Academy launch and Bisa House of Lords event all in early November, plus podcast partner events in Singapore and China. Check them all out on the global calendar at theedtechpodcast.com forward slash events. phew Right, on to this week's podcast. This week we throw back to June in the UK speaking to Olivier Cruzet, the Director of Pedagogy at Ecole 42. For anyone who doesn't know Ecole 42, 42 is a private, non-profit and tuition-free computer programming school created and funded by French billionaire Xavier Niel, founder of the telecommunication company Iliad and other partners. The school was first opened in Paris in 2013. Riffing directly from Wikipedia, quote, The school does not have any professors, does not issue any diploma or degree and is open 24-7. The training is inspired by new modern ways to teach, which include peer-to-peer pedagogy and project-based learning. The school has been endorsed by many high-profile people in Silicon Valley, including Ivan Spiegel, the co-founder and CEO of Snapchat, the co-founder and CEO of Periscope, the co-founder and CEO of Slack, and the co-founder and CEO of Airbnb, Nest Labs, and Twitter. End quote. The school divides opinion with some thinking the self-service and free-to-access model is positive and revolutionary, and others thinking 3,000 students alone in a room staring at screens is the stuff of nightmares. But 42 isn't limited to Paris. In the summer of 2016, 42 Silicon Valley also opened. 42's name is a reference to the science fiction book The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, written by British author Douglas Adams. In the book, 42 is the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe and everything. In this episode, I speak to 42's head of pedagogy about the theory behind peer-to-peer, France's new politics and what it means for education and how free pans out in teaching and learning. This session was recorded at Future EdTech. A big shout out to Qatar Foundation International and Class Central for sponsoring this week's episode. A quick message from them now. And don't forget, if you're enjoying the podcast, you can drop us a review on iTunes where you can also rate the show. Arabic is the official language of more than 27 countries and there are more than 400 million speakers of the language worldwide. Yet in the US, for example, less than 1% of students study Arabic. 
Studies have shown that those who speak a second language not only earn more, but are in higher level positions than their monolingual counterparts. And there's no shortage of studies that point to the benefits of students at the K-12 level learning a new language. The National Research Council in 2007 found that children who study a foreign language show greater cognitive development in areas such as mental flexibility, creativity and higher order thinking skills. Qatar Foundation International inspires meaningful connections to the Arab world by creating a global community of diverse learners and educators, connecting them through effective and collaborative learning environments inside and outside the classroom. Qatar Foundation International builds bridges across cultures by increasing the number of K-12 students in the Americas and the United Kingdom with a good knowledge and understanding of Arabic language and culture by increasing the number and quality of Arabic programs in state and public charter schools in the United States and other countries. Qatar Foundation International supports the teaching of the Arabic language through grant giving and programming activities while increasing and professionalising the supply of highly qualified teachers of Arabic, thus raising the visibility of a growing profession through grants, professional development and free online resources. For more information on free teaching materials and available grants, please go to qfi.org and ispeakarabic.com. And now, a quick message from our friends at Class Central. It's been more than half a decade since free online courses from Stanford kicked off the modern MOOC or massive online open courses movement. Since then, more than 700 universities around the world have launched MOOCs and more than 60 million people have taken at least one course. Class Central has been keeping track of the MOOC space right from the beginning. Over 10 million learners have used Class Central to find and review online courses. As the number one search engine for online courses, Class Central provides a comprehensive listing of more than 8,000 MOOCs. Class Central's MOOC report blog contains the most comprehensive coverage of the industry, including a recent listing of the top 50 MOOCs of all time. To find out what's up, down, new or just slightly left field in the world of online courses, head to www.class-central.com forward slash report. Now, without further ado, here's episode 90 with Olivier Cruzet, the Director of Pedagogy at Ecole 42 on peer-to-peer learning. So I'm here at Future EdTech and I'm here with Olivier Cruzet, who's Director of Pedagogy at Ecole 42. So welcome, Olivier. Just to start, for those listening in, could you perhaps give an insight into what your day-to-day role is and, in a nutshell, what Ecole 42 is as well? Well, um, in a nutshell, Ecole 42, it's an information technology school. We are located in Paris and we have been created in 2013. And it's a school with a very uh, specific pedagogy, uh, which is called peer learning. Uh, We do not have any teacher. We do not have any uh, lecture. Uh, Students apply in the 18 to 30 years old range. And the school is completely free for students. There is no degree requirements. And the students will face software development challenges at their own pace. And uh, they will choose their own path on this curriculum. And so if you were to explain what the students learn to an outsider, apart from all the additional skills, so collaborative skills, creative skills, all of that, the actual course is on software development and computing, is that correct? Yes, they are learning how to code. Yeah. Some of them already um, had some uh, previous knowledge uh, yeah. on how to code, uh, there are previous experiences, uh, and, and other students are just uh, starting the selection process without any previous knowledge, and it's also, uh, it's also fine, and they are uh, succeeding uh, uh, during the, the selection process. So the intake per year or per annum, is that 3,000 students per year? It's almost 1,000 students per year, usually 900. Today, uh, we have 3,000 students uh, since uh, 2013, the creation date of the school. And for those students, what's the criteria to be successful and enter the programme? Because 
I mean, it's an amazing opportunity for three years of free education on that front, which at the moment is tied to, you know, higher earnings and higher outcomes in terms of employability as well. Well, the, um, the selection criteria are usually a talent for IT. We have uh, almost 30,000 applicants each year. So it's uh, really uh, narrowed down uh, up to um, uh, less than uh, 1,000 uh, each year. So students who have uh, talent for IT uh, is its one criteria and also students who fit in this model because uh, School 42 um, won't be a, a good model for everyone. Uh, so as uh, in students and candidates need to test during the selection process if the way they are learning at 42 is, is fine for them or not. Yeah, because I think in the, in the Q&A at the end of the presentation, you mentioned there's 30 staff for a call 42, so to yes, 900 including students. including the cleaning crew. Oh, wow, amazing. <laughs> Bump the numbers up a bit. So, I mean, I suppose that's one of the things, isn't it? it with 30 staff to 900 students per year, it's not a necessarily a place for a student that's going to need all that one-to-one or extra support that perhaps some of the more highly regarded universities out there, that's what they sell their program on. Students will <clears throat> need to have some um, autonomy skills, yes, that's right. Um, they can reach the member of the staff, of course, if they need some uh, specific help, but I'm uh, sure that we have students that will never talk to anyone in the staff during the three years curriculum. If they uh, find all the answers, uh, everything they need, uh, just using the, uh, the internet, uh, and it have been created uh, that way. So students uh, will only join us for a very specific demand, just like uh, uh, I don't know, a student association. Okay, uh, yeah, yeah. That's what I was going to ask, actually. Is there any kind of social program or formalized program to help the students to initially engage with one another? Not, not really. We have a lot of uh, buzz on the internet. Uh, students who are coming uh, to the selection process uh, usually are well aware of what's happening. Uh, so uh, there are a lot of uh, exchange between students uh, before uh, doing the selection process. And during the selection process on site, there is a, a lot of uh, help between between themselves and the students uh, try to uh, when they are saying their neighbors who uh, oh it's too difficult uh, i can get it uh, and they, are, they have support from uh, other students because they are all in the same uh, in the same process they all know that it's it's very hard and there is a i would say a strong strong uh, bonds that are or strong links between students uh, during this selection process during the pc and we, and we spoke before about the the funding model so at the moment it's free for those students to go once they've been selected and it's funded by the founder for the next well six years and then to be reviewed after that point is that right Yes, uh, so far uh, Xavier Niel funds uh, the School 42 for the first 10 years and uh, we'll see at the end of the 10 years uh, uh, what his strategy for the uh, next uh, 10 years. He'll be like, right, come into my telecoms companies and make them uh, um, even more amazing. Maybe, I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's a possibility, uh, but it will be uh, his call. You have to uh, get him in an interview to uh, ask his, uh, him this question. So I'm really interested in peer-to-peer -peer at the moment. So there's a company called PeerGrade, which use this sort of similar idea. They work with universities to remove the need for lecturers to always be involved in grading their students' work. And they, so it sets up a peer-to-peer -peer review process there. And then I met a Danish chatbot company, which the, the chatbot is there essentially to help support learning through peer-to-peer as director of pedagogy, so what's the pedagogy behind peer-to-peer? -peer? The pedagogy behind peer-to-peer, -peer, from my point of view, it's um, the social constructivism of Jean Piaget or Lev Vygotsky. There are a lot of specialists that um, already mention this way of learning, also Maria Montessori, and it's almost 100 years old. Today, um, IT helped us to go this, uh, this scale, uh, 
uh, actually, um, because uh, the, these uh, previous experiences from the last century are usually uh, small experiences with uh, one teacher to create this uh, um, uh, constructivist uh, context uh, in, a, in a classroom with a small group of, uh, of students. This um, peer-to-peer -peer learning uh, uh, with IT, um, well, it's our intranet who is... Uh, just telling our students uh, the way to progress during the curriculum and they um, also the intranet we have a lot of documentation that uh, helps students to understand the peer-to-peer -peer model and to help them know what they need to do the way they need to progress in the in the in the curriculum so let's talk a bit about elections you've just got a new president what's on the cards for education and higher education and alternative models of education in France as you see it. I don't know if any policies have come out or if there's particular focus on education that is sort of a trend in France at the moment that you can share with us. Well, so far, um, I did not have a deep look in, uh, in the proposition of our new president. Uh, maybe we'll have a, a program with more detail on exactly what's, what's possible depending on uh, who will win the uh, assembly. But uh, there are some, a few things uh, that uh, so far uh, looks like not breaking, but uh, what have been done uh, during the last five years. Th the first um, decision are um, mainly based on uh, what's happening in primary school regarding uh, how to uh, learn how to, um, how to read and to write because uh, we have a, a big issue regarding that in, uh, in France. And... The first, uh, yeah, the first decision uh, are concern, not concerning higher higher education. Okay, interesting. What would you like to see? I would love to see. Um, maybe we'll have some uh, new and interesting uh, uh, evolution for our education too. Okay, excellent. To just go back to the the pedagogies and the pedagogical thinkers that we talked about earlier. So a lot of those are, you know, usually people referenced in the last sort of hundred years. Are there any up and coming thinkers who are developing new sort of styles of pedagogy that that you follow, or what, what's kind of like the future of that? Because we always talk back to the, you know, the greats over the last hundred years. But I just wondered what else we should be looking forward to. We are trying to always evolve our model. We are trying to train our students to have a mind agility. And yeah. so it's difficult for us to be a, a passive situation, pos position. And we also need always to try and test mm -hmm. new things regarding our, our pedagogy. But uh, it will vary from... Um, day-to-day -day, um, tricks and progression uh, system and uh, more um, deeper um, pedagogical principles. Today, um, our next um, challenges are, um, for example, trying to change the way uh, our selection process is, uh, is functioning. Uh, but this is not really a deep change uh, and it's not a, a new pedagogical principle. It's more uh, our daily receipt. Yeah, <laughs> and but from time to time uh, we are trying to do that. And for example, um, regarding uh, what did uh, previous um, uh, experiments uh, with uh, Jean Piaget and so on, I think that uh, peer evaluation is um, a more uh, a recent experience. Uh, we only had uh, some feedbacks from uh, a study in, uh, in Harvard or Yale. I don't remember exactly which. Um, uh, East Coast uh, University uh, who do, uh, tried peer evaluation and that's uh, this example that inspired us. So uh, I hope I will meet uh, some <laughs> new uh, other experiments uh, that can be a source of uh, inspiration yeah. uh, as uh, just like I hope uh, I'm a uh, kind of so we are our example is a source of inspiration for other people. For yeah. other people. And what did you do prior to this role? So what's your own background? I graduated from an engineer school, an IT engineer school, 20 years ago, and after two years in a, in a telecom company, not uh, one on like <laughs> Xavier and Yale, I um, uh, went into education with the same uh, team, with uh, Nicolas Sedirac, who is CEO, general di director of uh, 42 today, and uh, we um, actually 
the pedagogical model of 42 it's uh, have not been created uh, four years ago it's uh, 25 years evolution in um, in experiment in education so uh, since 1999 i'm with um, with nicola i'm developing uh, this pedagogical model and it was previous uh, maybe for 42 it was in, a, in other it school in paris Wow. Before you joined formally, you were kind of working in the background to create the to create the curriculum, essentially. I joined uh, I joined forty two since the beginning. Okay. Since, uh, 20, 2013 at the at the beginning of uh, of the school okay. year. And and if people want to find out more about Ecole forty two about what you're doing, is there an easy way for them to get in contact as well? Sure. Um, there is a email contact on our website www.42.fr and also www.42.us.org because uh, we have a campus in Paris, but we also have a campus in the Bay Area, uh, South San Francisco in Fremont. And do you have any other plans for expansion, so into the UK or other campuses coming up? Well, uh, not for now, um, be, but we have uh, several partnerships, um, 42 with this name, it's only two campuses, uh, but we also have uh, partner campuses who are applying exactly the same pedagogy and the same curriculum in uh, Johannesburg in South Africa, also in uh, Cluj, it's in Romania, um, and we'll have uh, soon one in uh, Lyon in France, um, we have one in Ukraine, uh, and we have uh, a lot of... Uh, uh, people who are asking us, uh, maybe in Netherlands, uh, maybe in Sweden, uh, I don't know exactly where are this project uh, right now, but uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, people who want to uh, replicate the, the, our pedagogical model. Interesting. Well, thank you very much for the interview. You're welcome. Thank you for welcoming me here. That's the end of this week's episode. Thanks to Angela Rose Sullivan from the US who posted a new review on iTunes this week. She said, I love the EdTech podcast. It's a fabulous resource that keeps all of us in the know. Sophie presents balanced views on issues that challenge all of us in EdTech and seeks input from industry experts across the globe. It's important to know what's happening outside of your country and region and the EdTech podcast is a great tool for enabling this. Thanks, Angela. Don't forget to sign up to our newsletter to find out about our upcoming meetup drinks, cool jobs currently circulating and other announcements. For full references, show notes and book recommendations, go to the edtechpodcast.com and for competitions and more, go to our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash podcast edtech. If photos are more your thing, we're also on Instagram. I love to hear your feedback, so do please tweet, comment or send a voicemail to us. Next week, we return with Heidi Fraser Kraus, Director of Information Services at the University of York, in interview. Have a fantastic week, and if you're out trick or treating, no throwing of eggs. Bye bye.